Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sergio Piño Viedo. I am um, the current president of the History of Pathology Society. I'm a pathologist, a hematopathologist, and a thoracic pathologist at Duke University. And uh, being a hematopathology person, I the, uh, thought about what would be a good topic to have for our companion meeting this year, which I'm very, uh, very glad that uh, you guys are here. Uh, making this happen. And uh, the topic I decided to choose was uh, the history of hematopathology and hematology. Uh, however, usually when you talk about this, you think to consider Hodgkin lymphoma as what we always talk about. But I said, let's move it from a different perspective. Let's touch other fields and other uh, uh, topics. And I think uh, you, you'll, you'll hear four very good talks with different parts of hematology, hematopathology that I'm, gonna, I'm sure are gonna be fantastic. Uh, before we, we do that, uh, we are going to, um, as, as something that has become a tradition, you know, a very recent um, thing that was instated by the society is the Henry Azar Award. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to show you uh, the picture of Dr. Uh, Azar, Dr. Henry Azar, but Henry Azar was um, very important for the society. He was one of the founding members of the society. Uh, he was originally from Aleppo. Uh, Syria, and he devoted his life to the study of uh, history of pathology. And, and at uh, very last, he even uh, had a bachelor's in history of pathology from the University of North Carolina. And he was a very good friend of our secretary treasurer, uh, Santo Nicosia, who is here. Um, the, the award is given uh, to a person who submits an abstract to the history of pathology society uh, related into the scientific discovery epidemiology, discipline of pathology development, public health issues, major academic institution development, and events stretching back into antiquity. And uh, a trainee submits uh, an abstract to uh, the history of pathology society. We rank it and we decide if it's good enough to, to receive the award. Uh, for this year, um, the award, um, as our award goes to Dr. Natalia Ramirez. Uh, from uh, Duke University, um, and so uh, she's here with us. Sorry, we're having some issues with her presentation, but now we can see it. Uh, and as part of this, uh, giving the award, we will give Natalia a certificate, and she's gonna give us a five minutes uh, presentation of the abstract and the reasons why she chose to, to have it. Uh, she's gonna introduce herself with the first slide, so I will let her do that. Uh, so Natalia, the podium is yours, and congratulations. Okay, hi everyone, sorry for the delay. Um, I will try not to keep us uh, from getting too past our um, time, uh, time slots that we have for today. So just briefly about me, uh, my name is Natalia Ramirez. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas. Um, stayed in Texas the majority of my life. Um, I did my undergraduate studies in molecular biology at the University of Texas at Dallas. And then following that, I went to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, which, fun history fact, it is the oldest medical school west of the Mississippi. Um, I graduated from there in 2022, and I'm currently a PGY2 um, pathology APCP resident at Duke. So briefly, um, my interest in the history of pathology society and history in general. Um, my father's grandfather was born in a small town in Texas called Oilton in 1926, and he actually served in the army during World War II, after which he um, became a history teacher in the San Antonio area before becoming a principal of an elementary school. Um, sorry, I'm like winded from running from the speaker room. Um, he um, loved history, and even after retiring, um, he loved talking with his grandkids and all of his um, family members about all the different notes that he still remembered in history, even when he was in his 80s and 90s. Some of the stuff that he remembered most was a lot of the um, interesting historical facts that he had loved um, throughout his career. He shared his love of history with me, and although I didn't end up pursuing anything historic, uh, history related as far as like further um, undergraduate or graduate studies, um, I still have very um, lots of interests in topics in history, and particularly now as a resident, very interested in 
the history of pathology and medicine as a whole. And so this is a picture of him back when he was in the army. So the abstract that I submitted um, for the Azar Award is called Deja Vu, reflecting on the 1918 pandemic and comparing measures taken then to developments used during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so why did I choose this topic? Obviously, COVID-19 um, was a global pandemic, very recent, um, and it had many impacts on daily life and society that we're still feeling today, even now coming out of it, um, now that we're in 2024. So when it first um, kind of blew up, I was a rising third year medical student. Um, and this is when the peak of social distancing um, was happening. I was um, seeing real time changes and how COVID was affecting the practice that um, medical students and residents were experiencing in their medical education. Um, but I also got to see the rapid development in testing for COVID, as well as the race to find a vac uh, vaccine that we would be able to use um, and administer for COVID. Um, and I just got to see overall the evolution in public health practices and as well as the public's response to COVID as it was kind of breaking out and as we were gaining more information about it and all the different um, preventative measures and social distancing implementations that were being um, recommended. So a lot of the things that um, we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic were seen before in history. So um, in 1918, the H1N1 pandemic coined the Spanish flu, quick, was quickly widespread due to traveling soldiers during World War I. And it's estimated that somewhere between 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide um, were attributed to this pandemic. And that's in comparison to approximately 20 million deaths um, caused specifically due to um, warfare in World War, World War I. Um, and in addition to all of the deaths, um, which were mostly caused by um, secondary bacterial pneumonia, um, there were, it, this was responsible for about 500 million infections worldwide. And so back in 1918, treatment was basically non-existent for this um, illness that seemingly came out of nowhere that nobody had any idea how it was being acquired. Um, and so treatment was majorly limited to supportive care with um, a focus on preventing further spread of the infection. So during this time, public safety interventions included case tracing, quarantining, wearing facial masks, and limiting social gatherings in public spaces, not unlike which we saw during um, the peak of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and during this time, there was an interest slowly starting to develop for new laboratory techniques to discover further what exactly was causing this disease. Um, and it wasn't even clear at the time that this was even happening because of a virus. In fact, um, Haemophilus influenzae was considered the causal agent of influenza. Um, and so in October 1918, scientists at the Pasteur Institute hypothesized that there was some kind of pathogen that was being responsible, and they proposed that it was a virus. Um, and so at the time, you know, everybody was excited for the possibility of some kind of vaccine against this um, whatever pathogen is causing this disease. And so people in certain cities were coming up with their own vaccines and starting to administer that, them to patients. And interestingly, the composition of the vaccines varied between all of these different cities, but they all only targeted bacteria that was isolated from patients infected with the influenza because they thought that that's what was causing um, their disease. So it wasn't until um, 1930 that it was finally realized that this pandemic was attributed to a virus. Um, and back in 1918, like I said, virology and the idea of viruses in general was still an in infancy. It was only a baby hypothesis that was being formed. Um, so it wasn't until 1933 that the first human influenza virus was isolated for influenza A. And by 1936, two vaccines against influenza A were developed, uh, but they weren't widely distributed um, until the World War II era in around 1945 when they started distributing them to um, the armed forces. 
And so this um, vaccine that was developed helped further reshape the priority of biomedical approaches in the epidemic and pandemic planning over traditional public health measures. And so the push for, you know, a the drive to find a vaccine, you know, first and foremost, whenever a new pandemic is breaking out, um, rather than only sticking to the public health measures of social distancing and um, face masking. And so today, in comparison to the 1918 H1N1 pandemic, virology is significantly more developed than um, back then. And the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic was much more quickly identified during the pandemic itself in comparison to several years after the H1N1 pandemic. And so we really quickly understood that there was a need for a COVID vaccine um, and several different um, people across the country and across the world were trying to develop that vaccine as fast as possible. And that's not to say that um, methods for prevention of spread of disease aren't important today, um, but there's so many more social, ethical, and political implications that are more tied into uh, some of these um, public health preventions that would limit us significantly more in comparison to back in 1918. Um, but overall, preparing for future pandemics is a continuously evolving field in which um, several of the foundations um, were started ev even as far back as 1918 when vir uh, virology and vaccination was only a thought in many scientists' minds. And these are my references. Thank you very much.